All right, hey, it's Rob, and uh, I've had a couple days to live with the Michael Jackson 40th anniversary double disc release. There's almost no reason not to get it. It's like 11 bucks on Amazon, of course. You can get it on streaming services and wherever else you consume your music, but uh, it's just a standalone package, you know, for, like I said, very small amount of money. You have uh, two discs, including, of course, Thriller, which uh, it says right on here, the world's biggest selling album of all time. And uh, and you get the extra disc of 10 bonus tracks. I'm going to talk generally about this release, and then I'll uh, just quickly go over what's on those bonus tracks and give you a little bit of my reaction to it now that I've had a couple days to live with it. I made a video uh, as a preview a couple days ago showing you what was going to be on it, but... I had heard snippets or pieces or different versions of some of these songs. Now, of course, we're hearing the official release that uh, is sanctioned by the estate, for better or worse. So I'll talk about uh, the songs that are on here and what I think. Generally, um, of course, you can't argue with Thriller. What a fantastic album. I never realized it only has nine songs. They could have stuck something else on there. I mean, that, you know is uh skipping out a little bit some of the songs were a little longer of course thriller and i think want to be starting something get into uh a little longer uh running times i don't know exactly how much but you know five six minute songs on here um but uh of course like i said there's no reason to comment on thriller it's uh you know fantastic there's amazing songs on it groundbreaking the whole thing you know well, well deserving of its status as, you know, the biggest selling album of all time. Something has to be, and it may as well be Thriller. Uh, fun fact, I've never owned it before. So for me, this is a win-win to get the uh, second disc of the bonus tracks and then to own Thriller, which I've never owned in any format. We just have heard so much of that record that I just feel like, you know, at this point, what am I going to get by owning it? I've heard these songs a billion times. I mean, other than Baby Be Mine, which actually is a really good song. That's another uh, Rod Temperton track on the record. And um, I think The Lady in My Life didn't get all that much airplay. That's, uh, again, written by Rod Temperton. But uh, other than those, everything else, of course, we just were hit over the head with that. If you grew up in the 80s, I mean, every five seconds you were seeing Beat It or, uh, you know, Billie Jean on MTV. And you have to remember how groundbreaking it was because... They didn't play black artists on MTV. Matter of fact, it was David Bowie, I think, who finally said, this Michael Jackson guy is amazing. Why aren't you playing his stuff? And they weren't. You just didn't see a lot of diversity in the early days of MTV for whatever reason. Just uh, the same situation, you know, that used to exist where you had rock music and disco and there was like nothing in the middle. And if you were a fan of rock, you were like a white person. And if you were a fan of disco, you know, or soul or whatever, you were, you know, probably somebody, you know, who was in a minority group or whatever it was. And uh, I'm not saying that I agree with any of this stuff. I think it's terrible. I think segregation in all forms, especially, re you know, relating to music, I mean, it was just awful and it was unsustainable, of course. Even in the 50s, you had Elvis and you had race records and you had music that only white people are supposed to listen to. Pat Boone would do the version that the white people listen to of the blues song or the R&B or whatever it was. And they'd have a rope in the middle of the concert and, you know, one group of people would be on one side, one would be on the other. I mean, all of it was terrible. And like I said, growing up in the 70s, it was equally segregated and equally frustrating that, you know, if you were a person who liked rock in general, you hated disco. And if you loved disco, then maybe you didn't like rock so much. I mean, those were the times that you know, we grew up in. And uh, Michael Jackson kind of smashed through that barrier, broke down that wall. Of course, he did it by doing songs like Beat It where he had Eddie Van Halen playing guitar. So even the metalheads were like, I gotta listen to Beat It. It's got Van Halen on it, you know? And even Michael, who said uh, Beat It was supposed to be the, uh, you know, black version of My Sharona. Now, there's not a lot in common with the song My Sharona by the Neck and Beat It by a Michael Jackson, but 
He just wanted this in-your-face song with a lot of attitude that, you know, you couldn't help but notice and you couldn't help but enjoy, whether you like rock or disco or whatever. So he kind of, you know, blurred those lines in between, this, in between those different types of music and it needed to be done. All right. Let's talk about this actual release here, now that I've gone into philosophy and uh, all sorts of areas that I didn't expect to be talking about. But um, So you have, of course, the first disc, disc thriller. Don't need to say any more about that. The second disc, these are supposed to be songs that were considered for thriller. And the estate says, for whatever reason, they remained in the vaults, they remained unreleased, they didn't get put on... Um, of course, Thriller, but uh, on subsequent releases or whatever. Although I think a couple of these ended up on the posthumous uh, album Michael. I'm not the biggest Michael Jackson uh, aficionado, so I don't know all the stuff that some people know. But I did work with him for two years. So if you haven't seen my other videos, I worked in the studio where he recorded Dangerous. I saw him every day for two years of my life. I was there uh, as my first job out of college, pretty much. So I was a gopher, a runner. I wasn't doing anything that had to do anything with the music. I was getting people lunch. And occasionally they would let me plug in a couple cables or set up a couple microphone stands or pick up some equipment or drop off some master tapes, that kind of stuff. But anyway, you can watch plenty of other videos. I have a whole play uh, playlist of them actually now called, I think, Michael Jackson's Dangerous. And... Uh, all sorts of different stories from my time working with Michael during Dangerous, but we're not talking about Dangerous either. This is Thriller. Let's get into what's happening here. I'll talk about, in general, people's frustration, and I certainly understand it, that these songs that are supposed to be considered <clears throat> songs for Thriller really aren't. A lot of them are songs from previous eras. You can hear just by the style. They really wouldn't fit in or... or you know, belong to a collection of songs like Thriller, which was a forward-looking, you know, futuristic music collection. You had things like Wanna Be Starting Something, which was like uh, electro-pop, synth-funk song, and of course, Beat It, like a heavy rock song. Billie Jean is even like a post-disco song, moves past, you know, the, you know, kind of, uh, you know, typical things you would have heard in... in uh, on a disco record in the late 70s, and of course the type of music that uh, he uh, was doing on Off the Wall. He wanted to move on and branch out from that, move along from that, and uh, that's why we ended up with Thriller, which is a very different album than Off the Wall, although I love Off the Wall. It's so cool. Yes, it's you know more funky and disco and retro or whatever, but... Uh, it's great. There's a lot of really great stuff on there. Let me talk specifically now quickly about the songs on here, the things I know. I've again covered this in another video, but having listened to them, now I can give you a little bit of a reaction of what I think about these songs, how they sound, and uh, should they even be on here at all. And uh, there are a couple of videos I've seen where people are like, why is this song on here? It has nothing to do with Thriller. And that's probably the case. Like I said, people know more than I do about this stuff, and they can talk about that in their videos. Anyway, um, Starlight, first track, is a Rod Temperton song. I actually got to hear this in the studio with Rod singing the vocals. Rod was not a great singer. He was a songwriter, and many songwriters will sing, and they'll try to sing well enough to express what the melody is and the vibe of the song or whatever. They'll put their own vocals on there, but, of course, never meant to be released, you know, uh, commercially or, you know, heard outside of just the studio or that kind of thing. So he brought in the original demo for Starlight. It was a little reel-to-reel -reel tape, and we listened to it in the studio. I don't know why. They just wanted to hear it. So, uh, of course, Starlight, we're talking about Thriller. Starlight was the original title of the Rod Temperton song Thriller. And Rod Temperton, of course, was from the uh, band Heatwave. He was a studio keyboard player. He had placed... Songs on Off the Wall, excellent songs. You know, Burn This Disco Out is on there. Uh, Off the Wall, the title track is him. Uh, Rock With You, I think, is him too. I mean, the huge hits Rod Temperton wrote. And uh, and then on Thriller, he had a couple songs too. Like I said, the, the less success successful ones, Baby Be Mine, Lady In My Life, but also Thriller. Can't argue with Thriller. So it started out as Starlight. They weren't really thrilled with the title Starlight. They thought it was a little weak. He changed it to Midnight Man, 
And Midnight Man was a little tougher, but eh, still not there. And then finally they came upon the concept of thriller and the horror movie and that kind of stuff. Rod went back and in two hours, rewrote the lyrics, and now you have Thriller. So this version of Starlight, the first song on here, is just Thriller with a different set of lyrics, Michael singing them. Uh, it's pretty much the same elements of Thriller or whatever. You're not missing too much from what you heard eventually on the Thriller record. Of course, Vincent Price is not on there and the sound effects and that kind of stuff. But the basic form and instruments and whatever of Thriller are on Starlight. His vocal, to me, sounds still unfinished. I mean, it's completed. They may have thought that they were done with it or whatever. It doesn't have the kind of energy and push and emotion that, uh, you know, he delivers in Thriller. And maybe he just was more excited about Thriller and that's, you know, what satisfied him more. And so he did a better job singing it. Who knows? Starlight's very cool to hear. If you didn't know the story, of course, it just sounds like Thriller, but different words. I played this for my wife and she was like, isn't this a thriller? Why are they singing different words? I had to explain what it was and where it started. But uh, <clears throat> as a songwriter, as a recording engineer, as a music aficionado for 40 years now, it's so cool to see where songs started, how they got their origin, and what they developed into. Also, if you have a song called Starlight, and you record it, and you finish it, and it's sitting there on the shelf, and here is Starlight on the tape shelf, it's very hard to then go back and think, well, I like the song, but the lyrics and the whole vibe of the song and the title, let's change all that stuff. You know, usually you would just move on to a whole entirely different song. If you didn't like the song or thought it was weak or whatever, you wouldn't just go back and tear it apart again and start from scratch and rewrite the lyrics. And but that's what they did. Obviously, Thriller, hugely successful title track of Thriller. Can't argue with it. Moving right along, Got the Hots. <clears throat> Got the Hots sounds very similar to Thriller when it starts off. Same key, same kind of uh, chords on the keyboards. Uh, it sounds like, you know, same kind of bass. And uh, almost sounds like an extension. Like, they finished Thriller, and then they immediately started Got the Hots. But uh, it morphs into another song. It's a nice song. It's, it's pretty decent. Um... It just sounds like a song, and like many of them on here, that uh, are good songs, but they just don't, you know, knock you over the head. They don't knock you out, and you can see why, you know, ultimately maybe it's like a B-side. That's what it sounds like to me. should be the B-side of some song. It, maybe it was. I don't know. But in any case, didn't end up, of course, on Thriller, and now 40 years later, we get it here as track two. But uh, anything Rod Tepperton does is going to be, in general, good quality. Is an excellent songwriter. He wrote Always and Forever for Heat Wave. Come on. So Got the Hots is going to be good. Number three, I think, is worth the price of admission. It is the best song on here. It's called Who Do You Know? It is an old school throwback, throw, throwback? <laughs> throwback soul song. Sounds like an early 70s song. I grew up in Detroit. We had a station called WDRQ, and that's what we used to hear on that station were these songs by the Dramatics and the Stylistics and the Spinners, and just these really solid, melodic, simple, old-school, you know, soul, you know, almost a quiet storm, kind of mellow, sparse, really great, solid songs. And that's what Who Do You Know is, just a great song has amazing harmonized vocals by, I assume, Michael, although could be some of the Jacksons on there too. I, you know, I don't know where or when it was done. It's clearly a demo. It's clearly something that, uh, you know, was a work in progress that at some point got abandoned. It's a very nice song. The only thing I could say about it is, who do you know? The chorus doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't relate to the lyrics of the song or whatever i think it's about a girl that you know went away or you know went missing or whatever i think if they called it you know where did you go or something that kind of relates to what the song is about she left me she's gone where did you go you know something like that would have made more sense than who do you know which is like what does it matter who you you know the girl's gone or whatever but uh other than that you know fantastic song like i said definitely worth the whole price of buying the the uh, package just for that number four carousel uh written by michael Cimbello. he wrote maniac of course i worked with his brother danny Cimbello. that was really my first job in la i worked with danny Cimbello in his home studio in venice sadly he passed away a couple years ago but uh very nice guy 
Another songwriter, he didn't work with Michael, but he worked with uh, somebody I knew, Ali Willis, who wrote September and Neutron Dance. I think he actually wrote or worked on Neutron Dance as well and did a lot of the similar kind of uh, stuff happening back then, the early kind of rap stuff, soul stuff, R&B stuff that was happening in the late 80s, early 90s, and that's the kind of work we did there in his studio. I worked with him for a couple months off and on and then ended up at the job I had where I, uh, you know, happened to, you know, get a gig where the first, you know, thing that I walked into was Michael Jackson's Dangerous for two years. So I just kind of stumbled into it, not knowing, you know, when I got hired, what would be happening. And they sent me over there and there I was for the next two, I think, plus years, longer than two years working on Michael Jackson's Dangerous or, you know, I should say working in the studio where they happen to be recording. Michael Jackson's Dangerous. Um, <clears throat> this song, Carousel, is very nice as well. Again, um, if anything, I think the problem with these in general is they just don't sound, you know, like a cohesive piece of what Thriller is. They kind of are of a style that's, you know, maybe more likely to have been included in Off the Wall. Maybe they were started during the Off the Wall era and they kept working on them or whatever. But so the style just doesn't sound like the upfront, you know, more modern style of song that we heard on Thriller. Carousel is very nice. Again, beautiful backing vocals. And uh, I love that chorus. You know, I lost my heart on the carousel. It's just kind of syncopated and pulls you along. It's very cool. It's a nice track. I mean, it, it could have ended up on Thriller and maybe, you know, you would have accepted it as, as part of it. But uh, good song for sure. Um, Behind the Mask, um, that one sounds uh, more lo-fi to me, almost like they pulled it off a cassette. And it makes sense. It's called Mike's Mix. Like I said, most of these say demo after them, and demo would imply that maybe Michael did it at home with his brothers or whatever versus something that he did in a studio. Um, so the first few have very nice quality, you know, they sound very professional and then it kind of dips into that area where things sounded like, all right, we got this off a cassette and we did the best we could to clean it up, but it still sounds compressed and hissy and whatever. And Behind the Mask is certainly like that. Behind the Mask is a song by the Yellow Magic Orchestra and they are a Japanese pop group. Uh, Ryuchi Sakamoto is in that group. He is a writer and a producer, and he's worked with lots of other people, Thomas Dolby, different people. And uh, so Behind the Mask was a song presented to Michael by Quincy. Michael liked the music. He didn't like the words. He totally rewrote them. And then uh, after that, the thing kind of languished, didn't go anywhere. But Eric Clapton picked it up. He covered it, and he sang the words that Michael wrote for the song. So uh, I guess Michael gets a writing credit on the record, uh, you know, that uh, Eric Clapton put out as well. And um, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> you wouldn't imagine that Eric Clapton would cover Michael Jackson's song. In any case, the Yellow Magic Orchestra, I think, didn't like what Michael did to the song. So they told him, no, we're not going to let you release it on Thriller. He probably loved the song. It definitely is more modern, synth poppy. You know, it might have fit into Thriller. Somehow, it's not a song that I think is that great overall. I really like the Yellow Magic Orchestra. I've got one of their records. It's on yellow vinyl, and it's more instrumental with, like, vocoders and futuristic robotic stuff. Behind the Mask has a real robotic vocal on it, too. It is sung in English, but it's different words than what Michael wrote on this. Anyway, Behind the Mask is Michael's demo, I guess, of this song that they were considering. And it's pretty good, but like I said, personally, I just don't like the song that much so i don't feel like it's missing off a thriller all right i uh, can't get out of the rain i saw a video underneath that they wrote wtf that's really true can't get out of the rain is just inexplicable you know unexcusable it shouldn't be out here at all it's a song that was on the whiz from decades before the you know mid 70s or whatever and they simply just used a different line and uh, changed it from Can't uh, Get Out of the Game, which became Can't Get Out of the Rain for some reason. And then it's just repeated through the whole song. It's just like a funk jam. It just goes on and on and on. It just it doesn't seem like it's worthy of, an inclu you know, of inclusion on a collection like this. It's not good. It's nothing I would ever want to listen to again. And I'm going to move on. The Toy. The Toy is a song that Michael worked on, believe it or not, for 
decades, from 82 when this version came out here on the collection, all the way to 2008, which was the last song apparently he ever worked on, he ever recorded. It changed names. Again, I'm not an expert. Uh, it changed names from The Toy to Best of Joy, had another name. I think it may have come out on that Michael uh, posthumous release. People have definitely heard it in any case, but this is Michael's early version. It's okay. It's like kind of a soul ballad. Uh, it's kind of, you know, I tend to not like the, you know, syrupy, schlocky side of Michael, you know, the real touchy-feely emotional stuff, you know, the, the, the lady in my life and the girl is mine. I don't know, it's just not my thing. I tend to like the funkier stuff, the, you know, more uh, rhythmically, you know, exciting uh, selections on his records and that kind of thing. So for me, the toy is just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's all right. And uh, yes, based on the Richard Pryor movie, if I didn't say that uh, itself. And, uh, you know, that's when he started writing it, when that movie was in the theaters and popular and continued to try to do something with it until, you know, even his death almost. 2008, I believe, was the last version that uh, was recorded of this song. We'll move on to Sunset Driver. This is one that I think a lot of people know. And again, people are like, that's like a off the wall, you know, outtake. It shouldn't be on Thriller. Maybe he did a little bit of work on it. Michael, you know, from my experience working for two years in the studio with Michael, just tended to keep chipping away and and revisiting and adding things on to existing songs that had been around for, you know, years and years and years. And so he worked on many songs on Dangerous that may have existed before, may have come from Bad or even before that. And we would just kind of put them up and see if he could, you know, find some way to make something, you know, a little better, to make some improvements, to make some changes or whatever, to, you know, kind of make them some more modern sounding or, you know, whatever the case may be. But uh, Sunset Driver, I like. It's a funky, up-tempo song. It's cool. Um, again, it sounds like a B-side. It sounds like a pretty good song that's just never going to be a great song, never going to be on Thriller or whatever it would have been considered for off the wall, wherever it would have fit into the canon. And, uh, but, you know, glad it's here. It's a cool song. It's a good groove. I dig listening to it. Um, what a lovely way to go. Other than uh, Who Do You Know, What a Lovely Way to Go, I think, were the two songs that people knew the least about, that none of these songs were leaked out, maybe just snippets or whatever, but nobody really knew how they were going to sound. You know, are they fast? Are they slow? What are they like? So uh, these are the ones people were looking forward to. Uh, like I said, Who Do You Know is fantastic. That is well worth it. That is a really nice, surprisingly, you know, solid, good song. Uh, for me, what a lovely way to go. Just, yeah, as a songwriter myself, it sounds like a thing that you had an idea for, but you weren't that excited about, and you try to follow through as best you could with it. But at the end of the day, like, eh, you know, it's all right. Uh, I can't remember too much about it, having only heard it a couple times, but I don't find that it has a great, you know, melody. I think the verse is kind of weak. Uh, the chorus is a little stronger, but, you know, it doesn't really say anything. What a lovely way to go where, how, why, like, again, like, wh what is this song even saying? So, uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of this one either, unfortunately. She's Trouble is cute. She's Trouble, again, goes out on an up-tempo note. Again, a nice song, a good up-tempo, you know, funk song with a little bit of attitude. But at the end of the day, another song that would maybe be a B-side, but would never go any further than that. Uh, Michael dropped it and didn't do much with it. And so uh, Musical Youth, the reggae group with all the young kids in it who did Pass the Ducci, they released this as a single. I don't think that it went that far. I think it was the follow-up to Pass the Ducci, actually which was around 82, 83, the same time. I think it was 83, actually. And uh, so they released this as a song, and, you know, they completed it, and it was out there. And I also believe Scott Bayo covered this one, the teenage heartthrob. He, you know, covered this song when he was trying to be a singer, too. And around the same time, 1983, I think he had a couple albums out in that period. And uh, I'm pretty sure this one was on there. Again, just kind of a leftover song that you listen to, and you say, it's okay. I don't mind hearing it, you know, it doesn't annoy me or, you know, make me angry or whatever, like a couple of these do, but uh, ultimately, 
just not going to make the cut, and it didn't, and that's why we're seeing it here on the back side of this 40th anniversary release of Thriller. All right, wrapping it up here, 25 minutes, long time. All right, going to get out of your hair. Thank you for listening, watching, supporting my channel. Finally got to 1,000 subscribers, which means I can do more stuff. I can do uh, better videos and put a little more work into it. I'm motivated because now they're paying me to do it. Rock and roll. All right, God bless America. All right, anyway, thanks for watching, and talk to you later. Bye.